It's the beginning of a new month, and that means it is time for your piping hot monthly Bitcoin Digest. Today, we are going to be covering the latest in ordinals, the latest in Noster, and some of the very exciting ways that the Lightning Network is really coming together with the ingredients to scale in a massive way. Let's jump in. Welcome back to another video. My name is Ian Major. I'm an entrepreneur, Bitcoin Plub, and all around raging capitalist. And as mentioned, we've got some exciting topics for today. We are going to be going into the latest on Ordinals, Noster, and some of the fascinating ways that Lightning is really coming together, both with the incentives as well as the technology to enable this to be truly scalable to the millions and billions of people in this world. For those returning to the channel, welcome back, my friends, as always. It is a pleasure to have you. And for those new to the channel, I welcome you as well. If you like this type of content, I invite you to consider subscribing and join us in our growing merry gang in cyberspace. I cover all manner of Bitcoin related content, including a whole slew of tutorials on how to acquire Bitcoin, secure it, privacy best practices, running your own node, the Lightning Network, and more. With all that out of the way, though, let's jump into our first topic for today, which is none other than the latest on ordinal theory and inscriptions. So if you're brand new to this topic, I did a video a couple weeks back that I will throw up and link in the description down below for you to take a look at. It goes through the sort of how we got here, what is ordinal theory, what are inscriptions. And so today I'm really going to be focusing on some of the latest news and updates there. As mentioned in that prior video, this is something that has taken the Bitcoin world by storm. And I think there's a lot of interesting implications that we sort of debated in that last video. Is this a good thing? Is this a bad thing? Are there downsides, upsides, but suffice it to say, we have seen a lot of interest and activity in this. As of the making of this video, we are now well over 250,000 ordinals that have been inscribed into the Bitcoin blockchain. Uh, and we can see these couple of views from reflexivity research. Number one, you have dramatically higher taproot adoption. So again, this is not surprising given that you need taproot and tap script in order to do these types of transactions. But as you can see in this chart, you know, it was a, basically a flat line since it activated back in 2021 uh, and has seen a sharp increase. So sort of like inscriptions or not, it is the case that they are driving adoption of Taproot, which is arguably a very good thing. And furthermore, we can see an uptick in minor revenue as measured as transaction fees as a percent of the total revenue they're bringing in. That spike back in kind of November, December, I think was a lot of the continued unraveling from the FTX contagion and all that good stuff. And then lastly, we are seeing this huge uptick in the size of the mempool. So the mempool being the memory pool where pending transactions sit before they get picked up by miners and packaged into the latest block on the Bitcoin blockchain. And you can see the total size of this and you can get a sense for what this uh, spike has really looked like. With that being said, there's definitely this question of like, well, how long lived is this? Is, is this just kind of a fad? And we can see this other view if we zoom out a bit and also add on some of the latest data. This looks slightly different as well because the prior version you were just looking at was a 14 day moving average. So do keep that in mind. But this is looking at just, you know, mempool, total size, and you can see that while we had that big spike with ordinals, it has now come down quite significantly. Um, you could argue it's still somewhat elevated, but you know, you've seen posts like this back on February 26th, right? The mempool finally cleared after having quite a lot of congestion for a number of days and even weeks. So does this mean that the ordinals hype is over? I don't think so. Will they really blossom into this sort of whole entire ecosystem? Maybe, maybe not. Will they remain relatively niche? It remains to be seen, but there are a few signals we can take a look at, right? You have Yuga Labs, which is behind the famous Bathing Ape Yacht Club NFT collection on Ethereum. Now, again, regardless of what you think about all of that, it is the case that Yuga Labs is a billion dollar company in terms of their valuation, uh, I think their 2022 revenue was well in excess of $100 million, right? So, I mean, this is not a small entity. Uh, and they interestingly introduced the 12-fold limited edition collection of 300 generative pieces inscribed onto the Bitcoin blockchain. So that's pretty interesting to see. Is this just a cash grab that's looking to 
capitalize on this recent momentum and development with ordinal theory and inscriptions? Maybe, probably. Uh, but it is interesting nonetheless. You also have Ordinals 2023, the first ever Ordinals conference. This will be held down in Miami in May, uh, just the day before the uh, main Bitcoin Miami conference. And you've also seen the development of a number of different tools, um, whether something like Gamma, where you can go in and very, very easily make inscriptions, choose the type you want, put in the content, and you know, away you go. Or a wallet like Xverse. Both Xverse and Gamma come from the Stacks world and have really leaned into the Ordinals uh, play here. And lastly, you even have the development now of marketplaces around Ordinals, including uh, OrdSwap, which positions itself as the first and largest kind of trustless Ordinals marketplace. So again, two things appear to be true. Number one, we had this initial hype that does seem to be coming down a bit. At the same time, there are clearly a number of builders, entrepreneurs, and even in my conversations with investors, kind of asking questions around how can we you know, get into ordinals and all this stuff. So it remains to be seen, but very, very interesting nonetheless to observe this kind of new use case on Bitcoin. And so we will see how that continues to track. Curious to hear your thoughts on some of those developments. Leave me a comment down below. With that, let's move on to our next topic of the day, which is around Noster. All right, so if you're new to Noster, I once again have done a intro video on that that I'd invite you to take a look at. I am definitely going to do a more kind of nuts and bolts, in depth, how to use it, how to get onto it, what can you do on it sort of tutorial in the coming weeks. So do make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss that because there are tons of new features getting rolled out. But again, what I wanted to focus on today is just sort of an update on things. And so one great high level way to start this is the following view from Kevin Rook. Nostra profiles are up 5X over the last month. There are about 625,000 Nostra profiles uh, up from 108,000 a month ago. And as he points out, a number of these folks are not Lightning users currently. And yet because of the way that Bitcoin Lightning is being integrated into the Nostra protocol, a lot of these folks are coming across Lightning for the very first time, which is very exciting. You also had the big news that Damas, which is the Apple iPhone client of the Nostra protocol, was officially approved in the App Store. which a lot of people were waiting on. I was part of the beta kind of test launch that they did, but they had to cap that to 10,000 people. So now that it's fully in the app store, anyone can go and install Damas on their iPhone. There are definitely web clients such as Iris. Um, there's even Android clients as well for the Nostra protocol. And beyond that overall growth, perhaps one of the most exciting developments we've seen over the last month is Zaps. So for example, if you see a piece of content that you really like or that you really found value in, you can zap that user some sats. And because Bitcoin Lightning is this digitally native money, it's as if you're liking a post, right? Just the same way as you like a post, you can zap some folks some sats and people are zapping each other quite a lot, it seems. Um, there were over 10,000 zaps on this February 28th, just a couple of days ago. And so really there are a lot of implications there when it comes to content creators, when it comes to monetization models that don't have to rely on advertising, that don't have to rely on other other things. Just as a couple kind of case studies of that, you've seen Carla, who's part of the uh, crypto couple, you know, she's noting, I've made more money in one day on Noster than an entire year on Twitter. And that's despite the integrations that Twitter has uh, with, you know, with Lightning and all that stuff. So it really is like a vastly, vastly superior experience when it comes to, you know, tipping uh, content and, you know, Gigi got over a million sats on this single post. So that's, that's pretty nuts. Again, that's not to suggest that that's going to be the experience of, of, of anyone on there, but, but it is super, super fascinating to see how zaps are really bringing a whole nother dimension to the Noster experience. And indeed, all of this really is translating into continued growth 
of the Lightning Network itself. One representative of that is something like the Wallet of Satoshi, which has seen its Lightning payments going into parabolic mode, as we can see. So again, I'm gonna be doing a video in the very near future on going deeper into actually using all of this. So be sure to stay tuned for that. And while I created a Nostra profile quite some time ago, I really haven't formally transitioned over to that yet. But now that it's officially March, you may have seen the hashtag March off Twitter. Uh, I think some Nostr users had proposed like, what if we just did a month where we're only on Nostr? What would happen? Um, so that is that is going to be ongoing. And so I am going to uh, commit to transitioning uh, more over to Nostr than I am uh, on Twitter. So here is my pub key if you want to go ahead and add me on Nostr. And I hope to see you there. And so building on that lightning theme, let's now talk about our final topic for today, which is the fascinating way in which all the ingredients are coming together to make the lightning network truly scalable as a payments network for the globe. All right, and so my inspiration really for this entire final section is none other than Roy Scheinfeld, who's the co-founder and CEO of Breeze. I have done a whole tutorial on the Breeze wallet, which is really where his work on the Lightning Network uh, started. But Breeze has since become a notable LSP or Lightning Service Provider, which we will talk about. They've introduced their Lightning SDK, which we will talk about. And so really, if you're not following Roy, you need to be Roy is probably the best mind I have seen in terms of seeing where Lightning is going. And he, in many ways, is building a lot of the components that are gonna make all of that work. So I will link these various Medium articles in the description down below so you can take a look at them. And so the big idea here is this question of like, well, how does the Lightning Network really scale? I really like the following diagram where Roy is talking about the different pieces that come together that really make this a, fl a true flywheel. So on the one hand, let's start on the right, you have traffic. So you have increasing demand for usage of the Lightning Network. We see that in emerging markets with payments use cases. We see that across other apps as well. And so part of what Breeze has built is their Lightning SDK, which makes it super easy for developers to embed Lightning payments in their various applications. So if I'm an app developer and I know nothing about the Lightning Network, I can use this SDK to plop Lightning functionality into my app. And these are apps that have pre-existing users. So you're now further increasing the demand and usage of Lightning. Because you're increasing the demand for Lightning, you are increasing the routing fees, right? And so that's what he's talking about when he says yield on this diagram. And the beautiful thing is this is not a staking yield. This is not a yield where you need to relinquish control of your keys. This is arguably the very first type of real pure yield without transferring custody of your underlying Bitcoin. And so yield here might be measured, for example, on what are the total routing fees you generated for forwarding lightning payments as a percentage of the value of your capital that you've locked up into the lightning network, right? That's that's how this yield concept is, is being calculated. And the more attractive the yield, then you get these LSPs or lightning service providers. And these are entities that can do a whole range of things. They might open channels with you, the user, so that you immediately have inbound capacity so that you can immediately start receiving payments over lightning. They give you a nice well-connected node that you can connect your node to. So that, again, this can all be non-custodial. You can run your own node and be connected to this well-connected hub of an LSP that maximizes the probability that your payments are always gonna find a viable route to get to their destination. And so this is becoming a more and more viable business model as the Lightning Network grows. And so again, the flywheel basically goes as follows. As the capacity or as the total financial capital on the Lightning Network increases, we have the ability to onboard more and more users. And as those users conduct different activity, make payments, you get that yield via routing fees that attract LSPs and so on and so on and so forth. Now, hearing that you may say, oh, well, doesn't this centralize the Lightning Network over time? And while that is certainly an important consideration, I don't know that that is the sort of inevitable future. You already have 
big routing nodes, you know, the bit refills of the world. Even Breeze's node is, again, one of the most well-connected, high-capacity nodes on the network. So you kind of already have this topography, and so you can still have users with their own nodes connecting to these LSPs to just make their experience a lot smoother. And so Roy has also put together this relationship between the APY, which is a, you know, perhaps more common measure of, quote, yield, so the kind of annual percentage yield, in relation to this ratio of the average monthly throughput divided by the channel size. So let's say you have a channel with a million sats, right? And let's say that you routed 2 million sats through that channel over the course of a month. Your throughput to channel size ratio would of course be two. And so you could expect roughly, depending on how you set your fees of course, to achieve you know a little bit over a 2% yield on that capital. And so again, this is a real yield. And so the people who say, well, you know, Bitcoin, it's just like this dumb rock of sorts, right? It just looks like gold. You don't get a yield on it. That's increasingly no longer true with the Lightning Network. And so what happens when you add the ability to make a true yield? This is not a Ponzi scam. This is not a staking yield that you get from the inflation of a random coin, this is true yield for providing a service. Like what happens when you add that Bitcoin's existing value proposition of being, you know, this incredible store of value, censorship resistant money, et cetera, et cetera. The answer, at least in Roy's mind, is that you're going to get a vibrant ecosystem of these LSPs that will play the other side of that flywheel. And this is what's going to propel the Lightning Network to grow sufficiently so that you have capacity that's matching up with the growth of users and activity, and those things just play on each other. And it's pretty interesting. He highlights this uh, liquidity, cleverly named, as the first kind of third-party LSP to sign up for their services. So Breeze is basically making it easier for an entity to become an LSP. And interestingly enough, liquidity is a is part of this kind of liquid fintech corp, which is a publicly traded company. Like, yeah, you could still go out and be a hobbyist running a serious routing node if you really kind of dedicate the time and attention to it. But I think increasingly you're going to see, you know, professional companies doing this more and more. And while again, there can be a potential downside to that, I think that's going to be vastly more outweighed by a dramatic increase in the ease of use and capacity for the Lightning Network to become accessible to billions of people on planet Earth. So I am nowhere near doing this idea justice. This is a profound concept and a huge deal. And so I would invite you to read the articles themselves and get it from Roy's words himself. But with all that, let's go ahead and conclude today's video. All right, yet another high signal edition of our monthly Bitcoin Digest. We talked about some of the latest and greatest in the world of ordinals and inscriptions, as well as the exciting development of Noster. And finally, this fascinating way that different sides of the incentive model are really coming together to propel lightning forward. But I'm curious to hear, what are your thoughts? What are your thoughts on any of the topics we discussed today? What would you like to see future videos on? Let me know in the comments down below. But for now, we'll go ahead and leave this here. I hope you found this valuable and insightful. If you did, you already know what to do. Give this video a like, use the share feature underneath this video, which really does help get this to a broader audience. And if you are so enamored by this content, you want to donate to a pleb, it really does help me continue to make these videos. For one, if you're watching this on desktop and you've got the Get Albi Wallet extension, you can simply click on that icon and it will let you donate right to my channel. Or alternatively, I will leave my Lightning address and Strike account on the final page that you will see momentarily. But for now, my friends, we'll go ahead and leave this here. As a reminder, every sack counts. And until next time, I'll see you then. Hey.